The title of the sermon I won't give you, but I will give you the subject. And the subject has to do with Christ's parables. But I want to limit them today to certain ones, not even all of them, it's too many, but certain ones in the book of Matthew. Now, in going through some of those parables, I would like you to apply them as much as you can to yourself, as I like to apply them to myself. And when I say that, we have to understand why Christ even spoke in parables. Now, when I came into the truth many, many, many years ago, I was being taught at the time by, you know, I was growing up in the Protestant church, but my father was in the Catholic church, so I kind of heard both teachings. The idea was Christ spoke in parables so that people could better understand him. Now, that is exactly not true at all. As we will see, Christ spoke in parables so that people would not understand him. The masses would not understand him. But he would then explain the parables to his disciples so that they could understand them better. As we will see, a parable you could call a comparison. He is using physical things, physical events, to apply them to spiritual matters. And his parables basically speak about the kingdom of God. Now, the first parable I'd like to read with you is in Matthew chapter 7. And the interesting thing is that in many Bibles you will find headlines and headnotes, and they will say, oh, the parable of this and the parable of that. But when it comes to Matthew chapter 7, they don't even say it's a parable, but it clearly is one as we will see in a moment. Matthew chapter 7, and I like to read verses 24 to 27. And I call it the parable of the house on the rock and the sand. And notice carefully what Christ is saying here. In Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 24, and let's ask ourselves how this applies to us in relationship to our entrance into the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him, showing it's a parable, it's a comparison. I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Now everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Now notice... In both cases, the same circumstances occur. The same trials, if you please, occur. The same winds blow. But in one case, a house stands. In the other case, a house falls. And great was its fall. Now, if you look at the parallel passage, just let's turn to that real quick in Luke chapter 6. Luke is adding one other interesting point. Luke chapter 6, and I'm reading for this 46 to 49. Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 46, he says, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house, notice, who dug deep. Who dug deep. And laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, a stream beat vehemently against that house and couldn't shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard it and didn't and did do nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. Now that's important. We'll come back to that. Immediately it fell when the trial strikes. And the ruin of that house was great. Now, what is Christ saying here? 
Christ is saying here that if we want to enter the kingdom of God, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, if I want to enter the kingdom of God, we have to build our lives on the rock. And who or what is that rock? None other than Jesus Christ. There can be no foundation except the one which is laid in Jesus Christ. And so, I don't care what religion people might belong to, unless they believe in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, the one who came to die for them, the one who paid the penalty for our sins, which is death, they will have no entrance in the kingdom of God. They are those who have built their lives on sand, on quicksand. And that also goes for nominal Christians who haven't really built their lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And when the trials come, they will not be successful. You see, we cannot be successful unless Jesus Christ, God the Father, live in us through the Holy Spirit. Unless we have God's Holy Spirit within us, we are not going to enter the kingdom of God. So, if you look at this as the introductory parable, let's now look at the very famous one in Matthew chapter 13. The very famous parable of the sower. And I hate to say it, a parable which has been greatly misunderstood, even in the Church of God. So let's look at it carefully, what's being said here. Matthew chapter 13, and I'm going to read all the way, beginning at verse 1 to verse 23. The parable of the sower. Matthew 13, beginning at verse 1. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And then he spoke many things in them or to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out a sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. And some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up, because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, and some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples, verse 10, came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you, just the disciples, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Now, Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven. Mark, Luke, and John speak about the kingdom of God. The same thing is mentioned. It is a kingdom which is right now in heaven because God is in heaven, but it's going to be coming down to this earth and it's going to be ruled from heaven. Notice, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, but to them it has not been given. So why is it that so many people today try to proselytize others, try to convert them to the truth? If it hasn't been given to them, they are not going to be able to understand for, verse 12, whoever has to him, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever doesn't have, even what he has will be taken away from him. That will be something we are going to talk about in a moment as well in another parable. Remember that. What he has will be taken away from him. Verse 13, therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see. And hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the heart of this people has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, but now comes an individual responsibility as well. And their eyes they have closed. Notice this. Their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their heart and turn, so that I should heal them. 
But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and didn't see it, and to hear what you hear, and didn't hear it. Now here is being emphasized the point that you cannot understand unless God opens your eyes. But you see, once God begins to open your eyes, then comes individual responsibility. And some are still closing their eyes. They don't want to see. They don't want to hear. Because they don't want to act pursuant to what God tells them. Let's keep reading in verse 18. Therefore now hear the parable of the sower. So he starts explaining what his parable meant for us, for the disciples. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and doesn't understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away that was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who receives the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. And we have people like that. They hear one or two sermons over the internet and they are immediately ready for baptism. So they think. Yet, verse 21, he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation, trials, persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. And we have that too. Somebody may contact me and all enthusiastic, and then I find out something where change is necessary and no we don't want to do that we don't want to live that way verse 22 now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful so there was a little bit fruit there but then the person gives up but he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears, bears fruit and produces, and some a hundredfold, and some sixty, and some thirty. Now, if you go to Mark chapter 4 and verse 13, Christ is saying that this is a critical, crucial parable to understand. Because he says in Mark chapter 4 and verse 13, he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? So his point is, if you don't understand the parable of the sower, you can't even understand the others. It's a foundational parable. But also now Luke, let, let's look at Luke chapter 8 and verse 15, because this is also again the same parable. But Luke is adding an interesting point here. Luke chapter 8 and in verse 15. Because what is the one described on whom the seed falls, that good ground? But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart. It's not enough to just hear the word, you see. You have to have a receptive, a noble, a good heart. He keeps it and he bears fruit, notice, with patience. You have to bear fruit with patience. It doesn't happen right all at once. Patience, perseverance is necessary. Now, this is one parable, as I said, which is a foundational one, and it has been foundationally misunderstood by some. Now, we have a booklet. We happen to have a booklet. We have several booklets. This one is entitled, Are You Predestined to be Saved? Now, predestination is another one of these topics which have been greatly misunderstood in the church. Partially because people have forgotten what Mr. Armstrong has taught about it. But in this book that we also cover this parable. Because some have said that, of course, we're talking here about four categories. That the first three categories describes people who have been called, but have fallen away, have rejected their calling. And only the fourth category are the ones who have been called and then have been chosen. 
Now, that is terribly wrong. Because if that were true, if God would have called the first three categories for salvation, right, and then they would have fallen away, they would have committed the unpardonable sin. And that is impossible to believe. No, these first three weren't called. They weren't even called. As our booklet points out, when the Bible talks about somebody is being called for salvation, he is chosen. Same thing. These terms are being used interchangeably. And so if you haven't read our booklet on this issue, you want to please read it and make clear you understand. Because you see, when God calls someone to salvation, Paul says, I am confident that he will carry out this good work he has begun in someone. Now, that doesn't mean that you still cannot fall away. But it does mean that, first of all, you have to have God's Holy Spirit. That's what, means, what it means when you are called and chosen and faithful. Now, Mr. Armstrong, and I'd like to quickly quote this when it talks about predestination, because if you are called for salvation, you have been predestined to be called from the foundation of the earth. Did you know that? That is why so many people today cannot come to God because they are simply not called yet to come to God. Their opportunity for salvation is going to come. It may come in the millennium. It may come in the great white throne judgment. You see, in order to be called today to salvation, you are predestined. You have been predestined. Notice that has been the church's teaching for I don't know how long. And we quote here from Mr. Armstrong's booklet, Predestination, does about the teach it, copyrighted 957, where he says, Predestination has only to do with the time of your calling, the time, whether you are called now, in this age, or later. Notice it in this passage in Romans chapter 8, for whom he did foreknow, how great is God, he says, if you are now called, God foreknew you knew you thousands of years before you were born. Now, do you believe that? That's what the Bible teaches. God knew you thousands of years before you were born. That's what predestination is all about. He goes on to say predestination has to do with being called, not with being saved or lost. Those now being called in this age were foreknown and predestined to be called now to be the first to put their hope in Christ. All others have their call later. God decides far in advance which ones he would call in this first calling, to be a priest or a king in his kingdom, to have a part in the saving of others. You know, that's a remarkable, remarkable statement, if you think about it, and how much grateful do we have to be that God has thousands of years ago decided to call you today. But you still have your part to play, of course. And you know, those who respond to that call, they bring fruit. Now, not everybody brings fruit 100%. Theoretically, everybody could have. But some only bring 50 or 30 times. But at least they bring fruit. In our book, on Predestination, we write about this particular passage in the parable of Mrs. Sower, four types of people are mentioned who all hear the word of God, but only one person accepts the word and produces fruit, while the other three give up and fall away. Does this mean that all of them were truly called by God to salvation and that God was caught by surprise when the first three fell away, although he had predestined them to be called in this day and age? Hardly. God very well knew that only the fourth person would respond and continue in his calling, as God knows the hearts and minds of people. Only the fourth person was predestined to be called and chosen in this life. Now, as we will see, being called can also mean something else than just being called to salvation. And that's very important to understand. God can call people today to have a physical relationship with him, not a spiritual one. In Old Testament times, ancient Israel was never offered the Holy Spirit. And still, God created and wanted to have a physical relationship with the people. 
See, he expected of them to keep the Ten Commandments, even though he understood he, they couldn't keep it according to the Spirit because they didn't have the Spirit. But he expected of them at least they should keep it by the letter. But even that they didn't do. Today, even the United States of America, Great Britain, the modern descendants of the House of Israel, could do a lot better. God expects of them at least to keep the Ten Commandments by the letter. They don't do that. Of course, no other nation does either. And so, we will see in a moment that God did call people to have a physical relationship with him. But we have to understand when we read a scripture like the parable of the sower, he's not talking about that he has called all four categories to salvation, and the first three gave up and lost their potential for eternal life and ended up in the lake of fire. See, then God would have called someone for the purpose of having them commit the unpardonable sin. That is impossible, absolutely an impossible concept. So we've got to be very careful when we read those parables to understand what they say and what they don't say. Let's look at the third one in Matthew chapter 13 and in verse 33. I just want to mention this right now because we are entering the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread. And of course, during the Days of Unleavened Bread, we don't eat any leavened products because during that time, leaven is looked upon as a symbol for sin. But that's just a symbol because leaven all by itself isn't wrong. It just shows that sin becomes bigger like cancer does. But you see here, if you look at Matthew chapter 13 and in verse 33 in this parable, here leaven is compared with something very good. It says in Matthew 13 and verse 33, another parable he spoke to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, with a woman or which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till it was all leavened. Here it shows the positive quality of leaven in that it spreads, in this particular case, in a positive way. Now, how does this apply to you? How does this apply to me? Well, when we are being called into the truth, we will understand God's word at the beginning, not perfectly, but we are growing in understanding, as we all have to grow in the understanding, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And as we grow, then our life becomes more and more in line, or at least it should be, with the way the Father thinks, the way Jesus Christ thinks. We should become perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. And again, God starts small. He is only calling a few in this day and age, the first fruits. And when Jesus Christ returns, and we have God's Holy Spirit within us, and we are alive, we will be changed in a moment, a twinkling of an eye, right into spirit beings becoming members of the God family. If we have died in Christ, we will be resurrected and become members of the family of God. Let me just make this clear. We are going to become God beings. You see, God is a family, and God wants to reproduce himself. And you and I have the potential to become a God being in the family, the kingdom of God. And that's what the kingdom is. See, the kingdom of God is a family of God ruling over others. Now, it starts small, as I said. When Jesus Christ comes back, his family will then com be composed of those who have been called in this day and age beginning with Adam and Eve, all the way up until Christ's return. And then in the millennium, the potential will be given to all of those who are alive then, and of course then comes the great white throne judgment. So here we see in this particular parable how the kingdom of God is growing. Now people have no idea as to who and what God is, who believe God is a trinity, a close trinity. They could never understand that scripture. You've got to understand that God is that kingdom, which is growing. You see, and God's character should be growing in your life personally as the kingdom of God is growing in a manifold way when the time has arrived. Now let's look at the next parable and again this is one in Matthew chapter 18 and especially now in the times prior to Passover where we are to examine ourselves it is very appropriate that we look at this one. 
It is a parable of the unforgiving servant. The parable of the unforgiving servant. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. And I'm reading to verse 35. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Well, that's, pretty big. that's a pretty good number, right? In other words, seven times in a day, as other parallel scriptures say, my brother sins against me, and so he comes and asks for forgiveness, and I have to forgive him seven times. Oh, that should be enough, more than enough. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. And that doesn't mean you're supposed to count until you reach 49. No, he's saying without any limitation. Without any limitation. Now, you may say, well, wait a minute. If somebody sins against me 49 times a day and then comes back and repents, so that repentance couldn't possibly be genuine. It might not be, but you don't know that. But you see, Christ says, no, you always have to have a forgiving attitude towards your brother, towards your sister. And if he or she comes to you and asks for forgiveness, you have to give it. And he goes on to say, and now he gives that parable, therefore, verse 23, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, and remember now, the Bible says that we all, every single one of us, will have to appear in front of the judgment seat of Jesus Christ to give account. It says even to give account of every idle word which we have spoken. So it's very important that we repent of that and that's forgiven so that it's forgotten in God's eyes so that we don't have to give account for something which is still pending, you see. So we all have to appear in front of the judgment seat of Christ to give account. And here this is his parable explaining that. And so when, verse 24, he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, so quite a substantial amount of money. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and that all that he had and the payment be made. Now remember, this is a parable. Christ is trying to get a spiritual point across. And the servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. So he was willing to pay his debt, but he needed time. And then the master of that servant was moved with compassion. He released him and forgave him the debt. But the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred nary, a comparatively speaking very small amount. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. And so his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him and said, Have patience with me and I will pay you all. See, that's exactly what the servant had said to his master. But he wouldn't, verse 30, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. And so when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved. And you see, we are grieved, aren't we? When we see somebody who has absolutely such a hard, unforgiving heart that he is unwilling to forgive somebody else. So they were very grieved, and they came and told their master, we might do that, praying to God, asking for God's intervention, asking perhaps for a change of heart. They came and told their master all that had been done. And then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me, and should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry. Yes, and we do read about the wrath of God. We read about the anger which God has over wickedness. His master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. Now that's a parable. Here is the conclusion of the matter, what Christ is saying in verse 35. So my heavenly Father also will do to you. If each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. 
Pass, pass, always something which is being done towards another human being. You see, the lesson is very clear, and especially in light of the Passover coming up. And we have the Passover ceremony, this particular case, Sunday night, Sunday evening. You always make the point that nobody should take the Passover. We're still carrying, harboring grudges against someone else who still hasn't been willing to forgive another human person, another human being. It's very important that we examine ourselves so that we don't fall into that category. See, we have been receiving a lot of forgiveness, perhaps a lot more for sins we have committed, which are not even any, anywhere near remotely comparable to what somebody might have done to us. And God has forgiven us, but here Christ is saying, well, if you are not willing to forgive your fellow man, he says that in other places, God is not going to forgive you either. And so then the penalty of death is still hanging over our head. So this is a parable of an unforgiving servant, somebody who is not going to be in the kingdom of God. That's how it fits together. It's a parable about the kingdom of God, but it talks about somebody, in order to be in the kingdom of God, has to be the heart, the willingness to forgive others. So let's now go to the next parable in Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, and let's read another one which has been, again, misunderstood in times past, perhaps today still too, I don't know. Matthew 20, beginning in verse 1. It's a parable of the workers in the vineyard. Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, I'm reading all the way up until verse 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. And they went. And he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and said to them, Why have you been standing idle here all day? And they said to him, Because no one hired us. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right you will receive. And so when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his stewards, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they murmured against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour? And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day? But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am not doing you any wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil? or full of envy, as it can and should be translated, because I am good. Verse 16, so the last will be first, the first last, and then it goes on to say here, for many are called, few are chosen. Now this last passage is not included in many Bible translations, but, you know, we'll just take it as being stated, because my point here, I want to explain what this all means. You see, there are some who have been in the church for a long, long time. Some have been in the truce for 30, 40, 50, whatever years. They have worked hard. They have gone through a lot of problems, a lot of trials. And then there are others who are just called, perhaps now, shortly before Christ's return, as we assume that Christ won't be far off. And some will be called during the Great Tribulation, as we know, before the day of the Lord begins. Think of the 144,000. Think of the great multitude. So they will not have that long 
until Christ returns. And so many may say, yeah, but these people, they should get less than what we are getting because they didn't have to go through all these trials for all these years. Or, if you want to go to the first will be last and the last first, whatever, you know, some may say, oh, well, you know, these are people, they don't have a great position in the church, and so they shouldn't have a great position in the kingdom of God either. And just the opposite may be true. Those who are being looked upon as least today might very well belong to the greatest in the kingdom of God. I remember Mr. Armstrong saying it, you might have heard it too, that there might be a widow out there and all she can do is to pray and to have her heart in the work in that sense and she might have a much higher position in the kingdom of God than Mr. Armstrong even said I might have. So look at this from this angle. It may talk about positions. It may talk about the timing. It's most certainly, definitely not talking about many are called to salvation and only very few are chosen for salvation. That's not what the scriptures are even talking about because they all are going to be in the kingdom according to that parable. So that's not what it says. Now in our booklet on predestination, we explain the scripture in this way. In Matthew 20, 16, the context of Christ's words that many are called but few are chosen is one of different functions and offices in the church today, perhaps, and potentially in God's kingdom. While all converted Christians have been called by God to salvation, not everyone in the church has the same office or function today. Some are chosen to have different functions. Some are chosen to be apostles, evangelists, pastors, elders, deacons, while others have not been chosen to such functions Today, we are talking. Also, insofar as the future is concerned, some who were only called and chosen a few years prior to their death might have a higher position in the kingdom of God than some who grew up in the church and stayed in the church throughout their lives. And I may want to add the other one. Those who are being looked upon at least today might very well be very great in the kingdom of God insofar as their rulership potential and their reward is concerned. We say here, none of this takes away from the truth that God has foreknown and predestined those whom he truly calls to salvation in this day and age. See, this parable, parable doesn't even talk about that. But some have used it for that idea. And of course, you can't use it for that idea at all. Now, let's go to the next parable in Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 33. I call this, and it's called here in the New King James Bible, the parable of the wicked wine dressers. Now, we have to read this very carefully because we have to see who Christ is addressing here. Okay? Because it has a lot to do with the next following parable after that one, which we will talk about, which is the parable of the wedding feast, another one totally misunderstood in some circles. But let's go first to the parable of the wicked wine dresser. In Matthew chapter 21, beginning at verse 33, here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to the wine dressers and went into a far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants, notice, he sent his servants to the wine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the wine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, stoned another. And again he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. And then last of all he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the wine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So who is he talking about? Is he talking about two Christians? Of course not. He's talking about first the prophets who were sent to, let's say, Old Testament Israel and Judah. And Old Testament Israel and Judah, they didn't want to listen to the prophets of God and killed many, persecuted them. And then later, of course, he's talking about Jesus Christ. He's sending Jesus Christ, and the people rejected him. Verse 39, and they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Therefore, verse 40, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those wine dressers? And they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably. 
and leaves his vineyard to other wine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their season. And Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 43. Very important. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you. Who is he talking to? Will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever will and whoever falls on the stone will be broken. But on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Verse 45. Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard these parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. The Pharisees, the high priests, the Sadducees. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. What's he talking about? He's talking about the fact that the Pharisees were sitting on Moses' seat. And they were given certain knowledge. In fact, in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 13, Christ makes this very clear. Matthew 23 and verse 13, he says to them, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. See, they had, if you please, the keys to the kingdom of God in that they understood what people were supposed to do to enter it. They refused to enter it, and they also didn't want others to know how to do it. And so Christ is saying, okay, now this knowledge is taken away from you, and it's given to a nation which is going to bear the fruits of the kingdom. Now, who's that nation? It's the nation of Christians. We today are a holy nation. And we today are supposed to bring the fruits of the kingdom. We're supposed to live God's way of life. And we also are supposed, through our lifestyle, how to enter the kingdom of God. As the ambassadors for Jesus Christ. But notice in Matthew chapter 8, let's go back for another scripture to see very clearly that he was addressing the Pharisees. Matthew 8, verses 11 and 12. Matthew 8, 11 and 12, he says, I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The sons of the kingdom, referring to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Old Testament Israel, the nation, the ones who had at least a personal and perhaps general understanding. Because it says the gospel was preached to them. The gospel was preached to Abraham, we read. But they refused it. They rejected it. And Christ says, okay, I'm taking it away from them and giving it to the nation which will bring the fruits of it. Now, let's apply this personally. We now today have the knowledge. But if we don't bring the fruits of the kingdom of God, God is going to take that away from us too. And we are not going to be in that kingdom. We might be those who are coming from the east and the west and seeing others to be in that kingdom, and we are going to be thrown out. So that's, of course, a lesson for us. But here we have to understand he is talking to the Pharisees, called some sons of the kingdom in a physical way, and that is taken away from them. That's important because now let's look at the next parable, one which has been grossly under, misunderstood in Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. The parable of the wedding feast. The parable of the wedding feast. Matthew chapter 22, and I'm reading all the way, verses 1 to 14. Now, as an aside, the way this parable reads, it is very clear that these events are taking place on earth and nowhere else. But notice what the parable says. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. Now that's rather obvious, not what we're talking about. We're talking about the father arranging a marriage for Jesus Christ. And we all know that when Jesus Christ returns, he will marry his bride, his wife. 
The bride has made herself ready as we read. All right, so he's arranging a marriage for his son, and the son, the bridegroom, is going to marry his bride. Verse 3, and he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. Now, is he calling them now to spiritual salvation? Is that what's being talked about here? Now, let's keep reading. He sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. And he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fetid cattle are killed, and all things are ready, come to the wedding. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. And when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Now oh, let's stop right here. This is clearly talking about Old Testament Israel and also the people living at the time of Jesus Christ. The servants are the ones in God's service, the prophets. Today you could call true Christians. The ones who are being invited are guests. Notice this, they are not part of the bride. They are guests. Guests invited to the wedding but not as part of the bride. Now, here we read that they would kill the servants. That's what happened, of course, in Old Testament times. The prophets were just about everybody of the prophets in Old Testament times was killed. And then, of course, the army was sent out, and the murderers were destroyed, and the city was burned. That happened in Old Testament times when Jerusalem was occupied and destroyed under Nebuchadnezzar. And it happened later in 70 AD when the Romans occupied Jerusalem under Titus and the city was destroyed. And now it goes on in verse 8. And then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways and as many as you find invite to the wedding. And so those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. Now some people are quote unquote good people. Right? If you, you know people who they mean well and they do the best they can, but others are really bad people. You know, we know that too. But see, they're all being invited. And the wedding hall was filled, notice, with guests. Not part of the bride, with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who didn't have on a wedding garment. Now, he wasn't dressed appropriately. Now, notice also, a guest can become part of the bride. That is to be understood. But for most, it's talking about guests here. It's not talking about the bride yet. And so he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, few are chosen. Now, some have said, okay, these were all true Christians, all the ones which are being talked about here, and this shows that only very few will make it, and most won't, because most will be turning against Jesus Christ, will kill him, will kill the servants, and all that. Is that what the scripture is talking about? Now, remember now, it's talking about guests. It's not talking about part of the bride. It's talking about the history of Old Testament Israel and also New Testament Israel, but also of people, of course, who never made it into the church. Now, again, going back to our booklet, we explain this in great detail, which I don't have the time right now, but when it talks about calling, it can be talking about calling to a physical relationship, and that's exactly what happened here. God called Old Testament Israel to have a physical relationship with him. See, they were never offered the Holy Spirit. And when they sinned, they had to go through the sacrificial system in order to not obtain forgiveness of sin. The sacrifices never brought that about. But to create, again, this physical relationship with God so that they could stay within the community of Israel. This is what it's talking about. Many are called today to a physical relationship with God. Yes, America could do so much better. England could do so much better. In other words, many of the countries around the world could
could do so much better. As somebody has said, if somebody, if some country would even keep one of the Ten Commandments, what great difference that would make. Imagine that. Everybody would keep the Sabbath. Imagine that. Nobody would go out to war and kill people. Imagine that. Nobody would lie. Nobody would steal. Nobody would commit adultery. Everybody would understand what marriage is all about. See, no country on the face of the earth is doing that today. So even when it comes to a physical relationship, God has called people to, they refuse it. Let alone the spiritual relationship. Yes, many are called to a physical relationship with God, but few today are chosen for salvation. That is what this passage is all about, and it has nothing to do with the concept that, oh, God is calling so many people today for salvation, and most refuse and reject that call. No, most people are not called today. Most people are not called. I've heard people explain it by saying, okay, well, you sit there in front of an airport, let's say, and there is a stand when we used to have the old Plain Truth magazines. And so there were the Plain Truth magazines. And so somebody goes by that stand, picks up a Plain Truth magazine, looks at it, puts it aside, it's not interested. Oh, this man was called, but not chosen. No, that's not what that scripture talks about at all. This man was never called to salvation. You see, that's what we got to understand. So God is not somebody who is losing a game who doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, you have been predestined to be called from the foundation of the earth. You think God made such a terrible mistake that he predestined you to be called, and then the first opportunity this person gets walks away? Now, when you are truly called, let me just make this very clear, you are truly called to salvation, you will have the greatest potential to make it. God is not going to call you for salvation wondering whether the person could make it. He calls you, he knows you can make it. He is confident, he hopes, he has a faith, a belief, a trust, you can make it. But of course it's still up to you, whether you are carrying through with what God is telling you. Let's go to the next parable, Matthew chapter 24, verse 32. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 32. That's a parable of the fig tree. I have a few more here listed. I don't know how many I'm going to be able to cover today, but let's look at the parable of the fig tree. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. He's telling you and me, we have to learn something. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, now he had just talked about in Matthew 24, all the events which have to take place leading towards the return of Jesus Christ. So he says, when you see all those things, know that it is near at the very door. Now, if you look at the passage in Luke chapter 21, 31, it says the kingdom is near at the very door. So he's talking about the fact that when we see all these things developing, we know that the kingdom of God is very near at the very doors. Now, we have to look at the signs of the time. We have to, of course, look at what's happening in this world. And we see that, for instance, Russia is now apparently working on a collaboration with China and India and Japan. We know that the prophecy which talks about the kings of the East having to come together is getting closer. When we see that the tenth resurrection of the Roman Empire over there in Europe is forming, which it is, we know it's getting nearer because it's the last resurrection. When we see that a powerful religious figure materializes himself on the world scene, together with a political figure from a Syrian or German-Austrian descent. We know the things are very, very near. So we've got to watch. We've got to watch what is happening. And so he says, when you see those things happening, because then it's when the Great Tribulation is going to start, which is lasting for maximum three and a half years, perhaps a little bit less than that, because Christ says the days will be shortened, but most certainly not seven years, as some are erroneously teaching. All right, so they know, or we should know, it's, it's very near. Verse 34, surely I say to you, this generation, the generation which sees all these things happening, will by no means pass away till all these things are fulfilled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, notice, of that day and hour, no one knows. No, not even the angels of heaven. And other scriptures add, not even the sun but only my Father. 
But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and getting in marriage, or giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. Now, of course, nothing is wrong with eating or drinking. Nothing is wrong with marrying. It's talking about an indifference, an attitude of, oh, I don't care what's happening. I just want to live my life, and, you know, whatever else is happening, I don't give any attention to. All right, it says here, well, they didn't know for 39 until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the fields, one will be taken, he will be entering the kingdom of God, and the other will be left, he will not be entering the kingdom of God. Two men will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, because that person was ready, and the other will be left, that person wasn't ready. Watch, therefore, verse 42, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you expect him. That's how many would like to read it. Does it say that? The Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. So why would people want to start trying to figure out exactly when he's going to come back? Trying to come up with dates. You know, if that would be that clear, don't you think that Jesus Christ would have known? See, the point of the matter is, it is a Father who will decide when the time has arrived. We read that you can delay the return of Christ. You personally. Because God says that he is not slow, but he wants that everyone comes to repentance. If you have some repentance to do, you better do it. So that you're not guilty of delaying Christ's coming. At the same time, you can accelerate his coming by repenting quicker. See, but it's God who decides it. And so we have to understand that we are engaging in a futile exercise. If we are trying to figure out when exactly Christ is going to come back. You know, Christ is going to come back at a time when you don't even expect it. Well, that's something we should really remember. Let's go to the next parable in Matthew chapter 25. We have just read about, you have to be ready at all times. You see, many years ago, Mr. Colin Adair gave a sermon. I've never forgotten that. He says, he said in that sermon, Christ can come back within the next minute of your life. Because, you see, when you die, within the next second of your consciousness, you'll be resurrected. And for you, it will be the next second in your consciousness that Christ is there. So you don't know when you go out tonight whether you will be hit by a car and will die. You don't know that. We don't know when we will die. But we had better be ready. You know, on the other hand, we know for sure we cannot say Christ is going to come back tonight for, you know, the world because other things have to happen first. So the parable of the fig tree is telling us, and of course I don't know if I even read that. Let's go back to verse, 20, verse 32 where it says the parable of the fig tree. Now learn this parable from, oh, I did read that. See, so in other words, learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it, or the kingdom, is near at the very door. So in other words, we should look at the signs of the time, all right. But we know certain things have to happen first. Germany still has to unite. Europe still has to unite. The beast, the false prophet, haven't arrived yet. The temple of God, which is apparently going to be built still in Jerusalem, hasn't been built yet. But then, of course, the false prophet, not the beast, the false prophet is going to be in that temple, proclaiming to be God. And people will worship him. And people will be deceived. All of this is going to happen. Now, it can happen very soon. And that's why we need to watch. But we ought to be ready. Because we don't know when the time of our death is going to come. And so here is a warning in Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 1. The parable of the wise and foolish virgins. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lambs and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now here we have the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. 
Here we have the virgins, part of the body of Christ, part of the wife. So they are going out now to meet Christ when he returns. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. And those who were foolish took their lamps, and God's word is many times compared with the lamp. So they took their lamps and took no oil with them, so they didn't have enough of God's Holy Spirit. Because you need to have God's Holy Spirit to understand God's word and to live it. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom was delayed, you see, we have over the years thought in the past that Christ should have come back by now. When I was baptized in 1974, and somebody would have told me that we reached 2014 and Christ hasn't come back yet, I would have not believed it. Right? So yes, the bridegroom was delayed, didn't come as quickly as people had perhaps expected it. What happens? They all slumbered and slept. The whole entire church of God, according to this passage, is going to slumber and sleep. Now, many have been asleep for a while. And at midnight, see, when it's the darkest, right? At midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Now, maybe we have already reached that midnight. Maybe it's not... If you haven't reached it yet, it's not that far off. The time will come when we hear the cry, the bridegroom is coming, meet him. And then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. Now, it's a parable again, of course. So they are saying, well, we cannot obviously share our Holy Spirit with you. I mean, that's not even possible. So they tell them, okay, get ready. I mean, you know, do whatever you can to get ready. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready, they went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Remember when Noah and those with him went into the ark, that then God shut that door of the ark, and nobody could come in anymore after that. And afterward, the other virgins came, also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. I do not know you in the sense they never had proven to Christ what they would do under pressure. See, when Abraham was willing to kill his son, now it was a test. God never really required it of Abraham, but Abraham didn't know that. Then God said, now I know that you will obey me in all things. See, they had never gotten to that point that they really proved to God that they were willing to obey him in all things. And Christ says, well, I never knew you. I do not know you, it says. Not I never knew you. I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Again, the warning to us to be ready, not to wait too long, not to think, oh, I have still time, and I can still work on my salvation tomorrow, year from now. Because, again, he's coming at an hour which don't, we don't expect. Now, this parable, and again, this is why I'm reading it here, also doesn't say that they are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. It doesn't say you know, takes these unprofitable virgins away and there's going to be weeping and gnashing of, tear, uh, of teeth. That's not what it says here. All it says is that when Christ comes back, they aren't ready. So it is terribly wrong to think they have all committed the unpardonable sin. See, they still had some lamp. They still had some oil, you see. Not enough, though. They weren't ready for the kingdom when Christ came back. But as people survive these terrible ordeals and live into the millennium, they might be those who then will qualify at a later date. Now, if they die, they might come up in the second resurrection. The point, however, is this. Think of the embarrassment. I mean, here are people in the church, let's say. And 
Everybody assumes, oh, these are converted people, right? I mean, they, they just, just about have made it. I mean, when Christ comes back tonight, I mean, they are ready. They're going to be in the kingdom. And they won't, won't be in the kingdom because they're not ready yet. You see, again, this is something not to feel like, oh, well, you know, I have time, and then if I don't make it now, I can make it later. Well, of course, first of all, we don't know whether we can make it later. And secondly, I, I don't even want to be in a position like that where, you know, people are looking at me and saying, oh, I thought you made it. And you are here still in the flesh, and boy, what's wrong with you guys? So again, the warning is, make sure we are getting ready so that we are ready when Christ comes back. And that brings me to the final parable I want to read today, the parable of the talents. Matthew 25, beginning in verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Now, this now is clearly talking about Christ giving us Christians the work to do. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. So Christ doesn't give you more than he can handle, but he gives you what you can handle, according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. And then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, the one who had received two gained two more. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Again, so now they are appearing in front of the judgment seat of Christ. Christ is having an accounting. And so he who had received five talents came and brought five talents, saying, Lord, you deliver to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. Now, they had, this particular person had received eternal life. But here we're talking about what kind of a reward he's going to get. And his Lord said to him, Well done, you good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler. That's a reward. And of course, other scriptures tell us, you know, the more you overcome, the more rulership potential and possibilities you will have. I will make you ruler over many things, enter into the joy of your Lord. It's important. Far too many people don't feel the joy of God. They're always miserable. And they always have a ah, very grumpy attitude. Now, that's not how a Christian should be. Enter into the joy of your Lord, he says. And he also who has received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. So, proportionally, he did exactly the same. He got two, he traded two more. The other one got five, he traded five more. And the Lord said to him, Well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So, in other words, he's telling him exactly the same thing. Same reward. Now comes the third one, though. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you haven't sown, gathering where you have not scattered seeds. And I was afraid. And went and hid your talent in the ground. So the point being, God gives us his Holy Spirit, and he gives us certain portions, certain measures of God's Holy Spirit. And this man, this person, didn't use the Holy Spirit at all. Hid it was ashamed, was afraid, didn't want to stand up for the truth. Loved the honor of his men perhaps more than the honor of his God. You can't put in whatever you want. Loved mammon more than God, whatever. So he hid it in the ground. He says, look, there you have it. You have what is yours. Verse 26, and his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and you lazy servant. See, that's the justification some people have for not improving, for not growing in grace and knowledge. And Christ says, you are wicked, if you have that attitude, and you are lazy. You knew, that's what you thought, you knew that I reap where I haven't sown, and gather where I have not scattered seed. Therefore, you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I would have received back my own, at least with interest, at least with something. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him, who has ten, so he's getting even one more because he could handle it. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who doesn't have, even what he has 
will be taken away. We read that earlier, you see. What he has will be taken away. Here it's talking now about the Holy Spirit. Here now it's talking about the fact that that person is not going to be in God's kingdom. The person who has received God's Holy Spirit and refuses to grow, refuses to bring fruit, refuses to take what God has given him, applied in his life, he will in fact end up in the lake of fire. Because he goes on to say, and cast the unprofitable servants into the outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So if you put it all together, what we have discussed today, I think you see a clearer picture as to what Christ expects of us. He warns us not to fall into the trap of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those who have received some knowledge and reject it. He is telling us we have to use what God has given us to become the profitable servant, to become the one on who are compared with the good ground, bringing forth fruit. We have to be willing to forgive others who have sinned against us if we want to have forgiveness from God. And we have to make sure that we don't become envious of others, those who have only worked, let's say, for an hour in the vineyard. We cannot be like the wicked wine dressers who refuse to follow God's word. We can most certainly not be those who refuse to accept the invitation, like those in the wedding feast, and come up with all kinds of excuses as to why we shouldn't do what we ought to do. We shouldn't make the mistake that we are looking at the wrong things, wasting our time with trying to figure out when Christ comes back. We should rather concentrate on ourselves to make sure that we are ready when he returns. And of course, we don't want to be foolish virgins, and we don't want to be unprofitable servants. And of course, in light of the parable we have just read about the parable of the talents, we need to understand that when God gives us his Holy Spirit, he is absolutely confident that we will make it into the kingdom, but it's still up to us. And if we refuse to what he gives us, then we will not make it. Mm -hmm.